on the News Channel 5 Network. This is Open Line. Good evening, I'm News Channel 5's Alexandra Cohen. Thank you so much for joining us on Open Line. Tonight's topic is immigration and public charge. I'm joined by two guests here with the same group, Tennessee Justice for Our Neighbors. Let's start by having you guys just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your organization. Thank you, Alexandra. Thank you for having us in the first place. Uh, my name is Alvaro Manrique Barrenechea, and I work at Justice for Our Neighbors as the Assistant Director of Education and Outreach. We're a nonprofit here in Nashville that provides affordable uh, legal services for immigrants in, in Nashville. And I'm Wendy Curland, and I'm new to Tennessee JFON, which is what we call it, and we see families, we see individuals, we see people who are desperate to stay in the United States, and they have some legal remedy for staying and we try to provide the lawyers to make sure that they get to stay. Right now, a lot of the national headlines are about this topic, public charge. Can you guys explain what this is just so our viewers have a better understanding of what's going on? Yes, yeah, so public charge uh, is a new policy. It's what it's trying to do is limit the um, ability of immigrants to obtain a green card, which is a permanent residence in the U.S. Um, and so what is happening now is that uh, the Immigration Service is, gonna, um, is going to pay more attention into what uh, immigrants have used as public benefits and based on that they're going to limit or they're going to um, deny applications for obtaining permanent residency in the U.S. And it's scaring people. The people who call us are people who have American-born children primarily. Sometimes those children are getting food stamps or they're getting health insurance, and now they're afraid to take it. And the worry nationwide is parents will say, we'll take nothing. We won't let our children get health insurance or go to public hospitals, and those children then will be sicker and the families will be poorer. And even though they're American-born children, their parents, who are trying desperately to be documented themselves, will just stop getting the services. I saw that New York and a couple different states are now suing over public charge. I guess the agencies that would be in charge of enforcing it. Um, why do you think they are taking that stance? I think America, for 200 years, has known that we are all immigrants. That's who we are. If you scratch any of us down one layer, he may have been born somewhere else, or my parents, or your grandparents, but sooner or later, we're going to get to immigrants. And we think of America as a welcoming place where we say, give us your poor, your huddled masses yearning to be free, and suddenly our current political thinking is, no, no, if you're not rich, if you're not completely able to take care of yourself from the very first moment you hit the United States, we don't want you. Obviously, the other side of it, a lot of citizens feel if they aren't actually citizens here, then we shouldn't be paying for their food stamps and those types of things. What do you want to say to the people that feel that way? Well, I think it's a, it's a, it's a concern that is out there. I think there's a lot of misinformation about who is receiving those public benefits. Um, most of the time, what happens is that our clients who may be undocumented um, have or receive public benefits for their children who are U.S. citizens and who are entitled to receive those benefits. Um, and so what we've experienced recently is a lot of fear about our clients and just not even wanting to obtain those benefits for, for children who are entitled to get They were born in the U.S. or U.S. citizens. They just have parents who are in the U.S. and are non-citizens. And so therefore, I think that um, I can see how there is a concern about who's receiving these benefits, but I think there's a lot of misinformation about uh, is, are people really entitled to get them and how are they getting them? We do have one caller with a question. You see, you're on open line. Can you hear us all right? Yeah, hey y'all. Listen, I wanna call in. I'm American born. My ancestors go back to the beginning, the founding of Nashville in this community alone. And when I first heard about this, it absolutely disgusted me because I know what that fear is. Uh, my parents divorced when I was young and my mother became a single mother, which was rare at the time. My mother would not take any sort of public assistance, free lunches, 
uh, uh, food stamps, any clothes, anything. Because back then, if you took any sort of public assistance, it gave an invitation for uh, social services to come into your house. And there was some sort of movement to terrorize the hell out of single mothers where, I mean, they just scared them. So we did without food. We did without shoes and clothes and coats and things like that. And we lived in fear of anybody knowing that we were alone. So this absolutely disgusts me to have to come up as a child like that to feel that you're going to be separated from your parents. They're going to be deported or, or in our case, we were going to put in foster care and God knows what would have happened to us. I fully support what you guys are doing and I think that a, a, a nation, a bunch of people that are backing this up and say that in God we trust, I'm beginning to question what Lord they're worshiping. So thanks for having this program tonight. Thank you. She brings up a topic, you know, separation at the border. Obviously, that is something that's been talked about a lot in recent months. Do either of you want to respond to her call? Well, yeah. I love her. <laughs> and I think if everybody used their own personal experience to feel for the newcomers, this would be a better world. Yeah, and, I, and I, yeah, I want to I thank Lucy for her call. I, I, I completely agree on her stance. And I think that this is important to have a conversation like this and for callers to be calling in and expressing their ideas. Some may be against, some may be for this. I think that it's great that she's, she's um, using herself as an example. Uh, I, most of the clients that we work for are here on a humanitarian base. They're fleeing oppression, persecution. And when something like this comes up, the fear is there. And actually, most of this public benefits for their children who have been born here are, are probably who need it the most. We have Jack on line two. Jack, do you have a question for our guest tonight? I have a comment, yes. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I think uh, one of the things that most of our fellow citizens here in Tennessee don't know the history of some of this, uh, specifically that in 2009, uh, with the help of the American government, we overthrew the government in Honduras. And the people that we put in place to run the government of Honduras, including the current president, are now involved in a trial in the Southern District of New York where the president's brother is on trial for drug running. And the president of Honduras is an unindicted co-conspirator for this drug running trial. So many people in, in, in our culture here don't know that our own government has put in place people in these countries in Central America, including Guatemala and El Salvador, that have led to the destruction of the social fabric of those countries, and that we, in effect, are responsible for, in part for driving people out of those countries towards our country as a haven. So our responsibility for this situation is direct and unequivocal. And I think people don't leave their home countries unless home is the mouth of a shark. People don't want to leave mama. They don't want to leave behind their friends, their their culture, their language. They come to America because they have to, and then they want to be good citizens. People are always saying to me, why don't they just get in line and come in legally? That's like a constant question that I'm hearing now that I do this job. And I think, okay, well, how are they gonna do that? So we have these 50,000 lottery um, visas a year, and we have two million people a year applying for those 50,000. In order to come into the United States now, you have to have a relative or a job here already, and even then, it's very complicated. And a lot of the visas that people have traditionally used are taking years and years and years, and in the meanwhile, people are in terrible situations wherever they are. Let's jump to Linda on line one. Linda, do you have a question for our guests? Yes, uh, you know, she talks about, you know, it, it, they come from a place with sharks and all this and everything. But the thing is, you know, coming across the border, these parents knew 
at some point in time these children were going to be impacted or you know separated and their being in the united states illegal is a slap in the face to the ones that did spend their time uh you know it's going through the visa it's not the fact that we don't want those people here and we don't want to help them we do not want the fentanyl the guns you can't talk about gun control it's coming across the border with all this illegal stuff and everything and you know it, it, everyone wants to bash trump he is not the one that we need to be bashing we need to be bashing and educating the ones coming across the border that are putting their own children and family in in harm's way come legal what about the ones that did come legal it's a slap in the face we want these people here and it's perfectly fine for them to come but please come legal keep your drugs your guns your violence your m13s your all of your gangs out of our country so our country as americans do not become their countries thank you so much does she does she know that the crime rate amongst immigrants is lower than the crime rate amongst american born i i mean i I feel for her because she's obviously in pain over this situation and you I, I love her as much as I love the other callers but it is a very difficult situation and when they do come to Tennessee and there are now about 120,000 undocumented people in Tennessee they are working they are paying taxes um, last year immigrant households in Tennessee paid 1.5 billion in federal taxes and 500 million in state and local taxes. So they're not taking anything away from anyone. They're adding to what we have in our state. And I, I want to I want to thank Linda for her call because this allows us to to talk about this 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 part of the aspect of immigration. Uh, I personally came to the U.S. and went through the channels that that I was supposed to go through, and it was. It was an expensive process to go through. I was not fleeing persecution. I was not under very harsh economical circumstances in my country. And when I came here, I was lucky to be able to go through that process. But I, most of the clients that we work for are, are escaping a situation that they cannot, they cannot go to, a, to an embassy and apply for the correct visa. They might not even have a way to get here. Um, and so uh, I think that Yes, they're putting their children, children in danger when crossing, but I don't think as a parent you just do that voluntarily. There's a reason why you're, you're trying to escape a situation and you're trying to bring your family and trying to survive. And uh, I, I can't even imagine the suffering that happens when making a decision of leaving your home, risking everything just to go and find safe. Before the break, let's head to one more caller. Phyllis, you're up. Do you have a question for our guests? Yes, please. Uh, this seems to be a very old problem. Uh, I grew up in the East Coast, and then in 1976, I, I went out west, and I lived in Washington State, out by Mount Rainier, and I noticed the influx of immigrant workers then. And uh, it seems like it was realtors trying to make a quick buck, using these people to pick mushrooms and work uh, their farms and whatnot and um, to me it seems like it's big business and politics that have known about this for a very long time and even now we have chicken factories where they you know slaughter the chickens and very unsanitary conditions um, I just don't think it's right to point a finger at the immigrants I think it's big business, and uh, let's see, the cartels might be lying in the pockets of our politicians to let this continue for so long. Thank you. You know, people say that the immigrants are taking our jobs, and I'd like to know what jobs they those are, because a lot of immigrants that come to the United States are starting at jobs slaughtering chickens, just like she said, working in the meat packing plants, killing pigs, acting as nannies, acting as maids, working as janitors. And I don't see there's a big rush of Americans who want those jobs. I think that um, I want to thank Phyllis for her call. I, I, 
I do agree it's an old problem, but it's because we haven't, I guess we haven't found a solution. I think that the problem in the border goes beyond policies. I think it's a humanitarian problem that's happening. I think that it's a reflect of things that have happened historically in countries in Central and, and South America. And I think it's as a result, people are, are coming in and trying to improve their lives. So. Well, thank you guys both for your input. We're going to head to break. We have several people still on hold. Don't worry, we'll get to you right after this.